Today we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says this, No temptation, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. What I want to share with you today is just a simple sermon dealing with temptation. In this chapter, if we were to look at the whole uh, thing in context, Paul is talking to the church here, and we will get into this later. In other words, when it comes time to deal with chapter 10, we will talk about some of this and look at what Paul is teaching here about idolatry and the, the issues of idolatry within the church at Corinth. But in this one particular verse, aside from all those other things that he's talking about here, he comes to this one point that he wants to make clear in the midst of all his other points. He says that no temptation has overtaken you. No temptation has taken you. The King James says, the New King James uh, amplifies it a little bit more, says overtaken you. No temptation has taken you. There's no temptation known to man that is not common to man. Paul is telling us, Paul is telling the church at Corinth, there's nothing that you've been tempted with, there's nothing that you're going to be tempted with, no matter what you can think of, that is in not some way common to what everybody else in the world has ever gone through. And folks, that should be a real encouragement to us. It should be a help. Why? Because it tells us that we're not in this alone, that there are other people that have experienced things just like us, and that there is hope, even in the midst of temptation. But he says there's no temptation taking you, but as such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. I want to share with you, first off, three lies regarding temptation. Three lies regarding temptation. The first one is this. No one else is going through what I'm going through. I, I, hear, I hear, there you go. That's just almost as good as an amen. It's a laugh. I had a, I had a, I had a professor back in, in Bible school years ago, Dr. J. Trimble. He still pastors down at Prospect Baptist Church. Great man of God. Let me, let me imitate him. I said something. Can I get a witness? That's how he would do it, too. And he had a cane. I said something. Has no one here ever said that? Have you never said to yourself or said to somebody else, Ain't hey, nobody know what I'm going through. Nobody else has been in my shoes. You walk in my shoes. You do the same thing. Can, can I get a witness? Amen. Thank you. No one else is going through what That's a lie of the devil. That is an absolute lie from the pits of hell, and it smells like sulfur. The Bible says here, Paul is very plain. There hath no temptation taken you, come upon you, but such is common to man. In other words, whatever you're going through, no matter how bad it seems, you ain't the only one. Romans 3, 23, do you know what that verse says? There's none righteous. No, not one. There is nobody here who can say they're perfect. Amen. Everyone here has done something wrong. Everyone here has been tempted to do something wrong. As a matter of fact, I would guarantee you that you were probably tempted before you ever even got in the car to come to church. <coughs> Romans 3.23 says there's none righteous, no, not one. We're all sinners. We're all subject to temptation. That means that this reason this lie is so dangerous, it's because believing this lie will cause you to refuse to get help. If you believe this lie about temptation, if you think you're the only one who's been tempted, if you're the only one that is going through this trouble, then that means that you're ashamed to tell somebody else because it might make you look bad. 
And guess what? The devil loves that. Because if he can get you to think that nobody else cares, nobody else knows what I'm going through, then you will wall yourself up. You will make yourself an island. You will become a hermit, and you won't share your feelings. You will not take advantage of what the body of Christ is supposed to be, and that is others that you can shoulder up to, that you can walk down this road of life with and gain strength from and gain encouragement from. That's what God. That's what the devil wants to do with people. That's why there's so many people in, not in church today. Because they think that Christians are a bunch of holy people, that they don't want to hear what's going on, they don't, that they're, they're, they're the ones that's got everything right. And so because I've got problems in my life, I don't need to be in church. I'll only come to church when I get everything right because I want to be there with all those right people. That's a lie. More people need to be in here because you're in here and because you've got problems, you can help them with their problems. That's what this is all about. It's a lie. No one else is going through what I'm going through. Second lie. My temptation is too big to resist. My temptation is too big for me to resist. You know who Mae West was? Some of you older guys might have had a Mae West picture on your wall. I don't know. <laughs> Mae West said, I generally avoid temptation unless I can't resist it. <laughs> Did you get that? I generally avoid temptation unless I can't resist it. And then she's all for it. As a matter of fact, she also said that, um, well, I won't say what else she said. She was, she was a heathen. But anyway, <laughs> um, that is a lie. The temptation is too big for me to resist. We use that as a cop-out. There was a pastor who fell into sin and ended up losing the church, the pastor that he was at, got out of ministry and everything because of a moral sin. And in the process of explaining himself to try to regain some friendships with other pastors, he described a dream that he had. He told about this dream where that he was walking through the woods and he saw a cobra. And this cobra reared up in front of him and he was able to deal with that cobra for a little while until later in the dream this cobra became as big as a building. And at this point he was no longer able to deal with that cobra. It finally got him. And he says, you know, that's the way it is with this temptation that I had. There's just some temptations that are too hard to resist. That's a lie. Why? Because that's not what God says. What did he say? He said, Paul said of God, he said, God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with all temptation also make a way of escape. It doesn't matter how big the cobra is. It doesn't matter how big the temptation is. You can always find a way of escape if you want one. Third lie, there's no way out except to give in. There's no way out except to give in. There's a story of a little boy who was always in trouble for fighting at school. And the reason is, is because he said, I couldn't get out of the fights because they're always picking on me. They're always saying things about me. They're the ones starting it. And he says, I have to fight them. You know, that's the only way to end this. I have to fight them. No, you don't. Oscar Wilde said the only way to avoid temptation is to yield to it. He says, I can resist anything or I can resist everything but temptation. And let me tell you, Oscar Wilde lived a debauchery, I mean, lived a life of debauchery. I mean, a very sinful life and paid the consequences with his body. There are some people that believe this lie that there's no way out to temptation. We just might as well give in to it. We're just animals. If you're tempted to do something, just do it. Just feel good. Just do it. But that's a lie, and that's what causes destruction in so many people's lives. So... Three ways, three lies, that is, to re regarding temptation. Now I want to share with you 
in closing seven ways to deal with temptation. I mean, it's one thing to talk about temptation. It's one thing to admit the fact that we're sinners. It's one thing to admit the fact that we, we're all facing things that tempt us to sin, to displease God, to hurt us. Well, how can we deal with it? How can we deal with temptation? Well, the first thing is this. Avoid the candy aisle. Avoid the candy aisle. Folks, there are things in our lives that affect me and affect you differently. But if you're a diabetic, you don't walk into a candy store, period. I know so many people. My mother, for one, is a diabetic. Full-blown, insulin, multiple times a day. They only have one little section of sugar-free candy in a sugar store. <laughs> in a candy store. You know how hard it is to find that candy? You know how much other candy you've got to walk by in order to get to that one little section that has candy that's sugar-free that she can actually have? Do you know how much temptation she has to go you know, face if she walks into a, an ice cream store or a candy store or, or something like that? The best thing is just avoid the store altogether. And it's the same way with so many sins in our life. You know where your weaknesses are. One of the ways of escape is just don't even go there. Avoid the aisle. Proverbs is, you should know by now, I have a book out. <laughs> Proverbs is one of my favorite books in the Bible. Proverbs 4, verses 14 and 15. Listen to this. Enter not into the path of the wicked and go not in the way of evil men. Verse 15. Every one of us should, have, should memorize this verse. Verse 15. It's pretty simple. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. When you see something that you know is going to be a temptation, do this. Walk away. But what are we most likely to do? Look at it. Stare at it. Think about it. Wonder how we can do it without getting caught. An old Puritan preacher once said, It is our wisest and our safest course to stand at the farthest distance from sin. The best course to prevent falling into the pit is to keep the greatest distance. We play with sin. We play with temptation to the point where no wonder we fall into it. We get as close as we can. Don't just go up to the precipice and say, I'll get as close as I can, but not step over. Why? Because ultimately, at some point, the ground's just going to give way. Amen. And you're going to fall. Stay as far away as you can. Put up barriers. Do what it takes to avoid sin. If one of these smartphones give you problems, get rid of it. <coughs> Kids, if you're looking at stuff online, that you're not supposed to be, let's be real here. It's better to get rid of the phone and go and put a quarter in a pay phone that hardly exists anymore than it is to get tangled up with the talons of sin. The devil doesn't like letting go. And it will destroy your life. Believe me. Second way to deal with temptation. Know it's coming. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but as such is common to man. You know it's going to come. You know temptation is going to be there. You know as soon as you wake up, temptation is going to be around the corner somewhere, so prepare for it. You realize even Jesus was tempted. If Jesus could be tempted to sin, do you not think you and I can? There are some people that think that once you get saved, that once you become a Christian, that at that point you're sanctified and you will never sin again. Hogwash. Temptation. One writer said, Temptation often comes not at our strongest, but at our weakest moments. Amen? Amen. When we are at the limit of our patience, 
our love, etc. We are tempted to be unchristian. Beware, Jesus' temptation began, began after 40 days of fasting. You think just three hours of church a week is the same as 40 hours of fasting in the wilderness and you think that we won't be tempted? We got to know what's coming. Third way to deal with temptation, pray. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Do you know why so many of us are tempted to sin? Because we don't pray. Even his own disciples who had been with Jesus for three and a half years, Jesus said, don't sleep. Get up and pray. Yet so many of us, myself included, spend so much time doing everything else that we forget to pray when prayer is what we need to be most doing. If Jesus tells us to pray so that we won't be tempted, folks, I think that's something that we need to keep in our toolbox, don't you think? Amen. We need to be praying. Moving on quickly, fourth, avoid the candy aisle, know what's coming, pray, and four, quote scripture. Whenever you're faced with temptation, folks, <laughs> Jesus, if this is Jesus' primary response, this should be one of ours too. Jesus said in Luke chapter 4 several times, it is written. When the devil tempted him to turn rocks into bread, what did Jesus say? It is written. When Jesus was tempted by Satan to jump off the tallest precipice of the temple and said because the, the devil said, you know, you've already been promised that he will bury you up. He won't let your you know, let you be hurt lest you dash your foot across a stone. And Jesus said, it is written. He quoted scripture back to him each time. Folks, if we don't know the Bible, if we don't have it in our hearts, Psalm 119.11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You've got to hide his word in your heart, amen? I believe that's one of the things Jared's trying to, to instill into our youth is that the love for the word of God, hiding it in your heart, knowing it, having a passion for it, loving God's word. When we know God's word, the devil comes along and tempts us with something. We can turn right back at him and say, you know what? The Bible says, God says, and that will aid us that will help us to deal with that temptation no matter what it is. Amen. If you've got a temptation, and again, I'm not being specific about things because you know the Holy Spirit is dealing with your heart right now what your weaknesses are. It could be anger. It could be lust. It could be envy. It could be a whole host of things. Jealousy. Bitterness. Anytime you're tempted you know these temptations are going to come. You need to have in your heart right now a list of Scripture that as soon as you're tempted to act out whatever that is, you quote that Scripture, and I guarantee you the devil will flee. You find those passages of Scripture. You memorize those Scriptures, and you be like Jesus. When the devil comes to tempt you, you say, It is written, Thus saith the Lord. This is how I'm going to live. This is how I'm supposed to act. Not the way you're tempting me, devil. Fifth, have faith. Have faith. James chapter 4 verse 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Have faith. Because God is faithful. Do you see that in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13? He says, But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptations also make a way of escape. 
Have faith that God is going to work things out. Have faith that God is going to meet your need. You know one of the the big sins that is still going on in this country today? That has gone on for thousands of years? A form of idolatry. And you know what it is? They pick up the newspaper and they turn to the horoscope to get an idea about what's going to be happening that day. Folks, do you realize that Deuteronomy chapter 18 specifically forbids that kind of junk? And yet Christians will open up the newspaper every day and read it in complete, flat-out disobedience to God. I'm just being straight with you. It's wrong. Why? Because you are not trusting God to handle your day. The very one who holds the universe, the one that says, trust me, believe in me. I have your plans in my hand. I know what I'm doing with you. You just walk according to the commandments that I've given you. You do what I've told you to do. Folks, there are people right now that want to know God's will for their life. They want to know what the future holds. And so they'll go to a soothsayer, they'll go to a, a fortune teller, they'll go to the, to the horoscopes, they'll read the National Enquirer, whatever. But they won't even follow the simple commandments of God. They're out right now, and I don't want to sound too legalistic or too, too judgmental, okay? So forgive me if I do, just bear with me, know that I'm human. But there are people out right now on their sea ray, there's people out there on their sea dudes, there's people out there on skis, there's people out there with a really nice fishing rod that I'd love to have, sitting on the lake or on the river catching fish that I'd love to be catching in complete defiance of a very specific scripture that says, To not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as such the manner of many are, as much as you see the day approaching. We wonder why our country is going to you know where in a handbasket, yet we don't do anything to follow God's will and assemble ourselves together to help each other, to edify each other, to grow each other up in order to deal with the world. We wonder, why doesn't God show us what to do in our lives, and yet he shows us what to do in the very simple things, and we won't even do that. Trust God. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. Submit means, God, I'm yours. Whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do. My life is not my own. You bought me. You purchased me with your own blood. I do not belong to myself. I belong to you. I'm your slave. I'll do what you tell me to do. You do that, and guess what? Temptation is going to be a whole lot harder for it to deal with you. Number six. Don't even think it. Don't even think it. Turn over, if you would, uh, to 2 Corinthians. Just go over to the right a little bit. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This is something that we need to really get a hold of here. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 3 through 5. It says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Every thought into captivity. Folks, this is one thing I challenge you to do, young and old. Don't even think about the temptation. Whatever it is, the the devil loves to whisper in your ear. Your flesh loves to remind you of its desires. And your mind then does what? Thinks about it. And you'll think, man, I'd like to do that, but no, I know that's not right. Well, you know what? At that point, you need to do, (laughs) you need to put a barrier around that little thought. And then you need to squeeze it in and you need to delete it. Capture that thought. Give it over to Christ and say, you know, I don't even want to think that way. Don't even think it. And then lastly, I could say a lot more, but I don't want to take too much time. The last thing, let me repeat these. Avoid the candy aisle. Know what's coming. Pray. Quote scripture. Have faith. Don't even think it. Number seven, sometimes this is all you can do. Run. 
Someone once said, few speed records are broken when people run from temptation. <laughs> Stop and think about that. There's some people that are running, yeah, but they ain't running fast. Run. Genesis chapter 39, we read the story of Joseph. Verse 12, it says, And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in his hand and fled. And I love how the King James puts it here. It says, and fled and got him out. <laughs> in other words, feet don't fail me now. He took off. He said, no, I'm not going to think about it. You know, everyone in the world would probably have told Joseph, you know, you're a slave. You belong to that woman. You belong to her husband. She's part of him, so therefore you belong to her. You're nothing but property. The culture says it's completely okay. There's nothing illegal about it. You're just a thing to her. There's nothing to it. There's no relationship. She just wants to have fun with you, and you're her belonging, so just go along with it, and maybe you'll have a good time too. God will understand. Do you not think many people today would say the same thing? Joseph said, no, no, no. Why? Because I belong to God. And there is a higher law than whatever law man comes up with. And I'm not going to do this thing. So he left his coat with her in her hand and he got himself out of there. And so, folks, let that be a lesson to us. Sometimes temptation will come on us like this. And sometimes the only thing you can do is Run, but there's no shame in that. Amen. There's no shame in it. Don't sit there and try to argue with the devil. Don't sit there and try to rationalize things. Don't sit there and try to come up with a reason why what you think you might want to do is the right thing to do. No, just get your tail out of there. Run. Because, folks, temptation is a tool that Satan uses. And he's smart, he's sneaky, he's crafty. Run. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, what does it say? Verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. So I say the same thing Paul says, maybe in a different way. You know what I'm talking about. Run. 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 You judge for yourself what you need to do.